not revolution but evolution excerpt from tython and aurora by johann gottfried herder 1744 to 1803 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Tython and Aurora, beginning on page 244. Let us now speak of waking and rejuvenescence. How is this brought about? By revolution? I confess that among the misused words of our modern fashionable vocabulary, few are so displeasing to me as this, because it is entirely departed from its original pure signification and carries with it the most mischievous confusion of thought in astronomy we call revolution a movement of the great world bodies which returns to itself determined by measure number and forces a movement which is not only the most peaceful order in itself but in connection with other harmonious powers establishes the kingdom of eternal order thus the earth revolves around itself and makes day and night and by means of these arranges and regulates the sleep and the waking of its creatures their time for rest and the circle of their occupations thus the earth moves around the sun and makes the year and by means of that the seasons and by means of them the changes of labor and of mortal enjoyment the revolution of the moon around our earth gives to the sea its ebb and flood determines the periods of diseases and perhaps of the growth of plants in this sense it is useful to notice revolutions for in them we observe a course of affairs which returns into itself and in that course of things the laws of a perpetual order in such a course there is nothing abrupt arbitrary without reason there is nothing of destruction in it but a gently vibrating thread of conservation revolutions of this kind are the dance of the hours around the throne of jupiter they are the chaplet of victory on the immortal head of the god after the conquest of chaos also if we draw down this idea of revolution from heaven to earth it can be no other than the idea of a silent progress of things of a reappearance of certain phenomena according to their peculiar nature consequently of the design of an ever-working wisdom order and goodness in this sense we speak of the revolution of arts and sciences that is a periodical return of them the causes of which we endeavor to investigate in history and as it were to calculate astronomically thus the pythagorean spoke of the revolutions of the human soul that is of its periodical return into other forms thus have men investigated the laws of the revolution of human thoughts when they return from oblivion into remembrance when visions and desires when activities and passions which had gone to sleep reappear once more in all these things it has been attempted to discover the laws of a hidden silent order of nature but the meaning of this word has undergone a detestable change because in the barbarous centuries men knew of no other revolutions than conquests overturns oppressions confusions without motive aim or order then it was called revolution when the nethermost was made uppermost when by the so-called right of war a nation lost more or less of its property its laws its goods or when by the right of monarchy all those so-called rights were enforced which st thomas machiavel and naudi afterwards collected from actual events and brought together in one chapter then finally it was called a revolution when the ministers did what the rulers themselves would not do 
or when here and there the people undertook that which they could rarely execute so well as kings and ministers. Hence the numerous histories des revolutions, a kind of book whose title is all the more popular that its contents are, for the most part, unintelligible or abominable. The notion of an aim or object was almost lost sight of. History became an exhibition of entanglements without a denouement, for after the conclusion of each revolution, so called, the confusion in the kingdoms where they occurred was greater than before. Revolutions of this sort, whencesoever they may derive their origin, are signs of barbarism, of an insolent force, of a mad willfulness. The more reason and moderation increase among men, the rarer they will become, until at last they entirely disappear. Then the word revolution will revert to its pure and true meaning. Then it will mean in history also as elsewhere a course of things arranged according to laws, a course of events which peacefully returns into itself. In this view alone is history worth the study. For as to the revolutions of wild elephants, when they tear up trees and devastate villages, from these there is not much to be learned. Not to mislead, therefore, with this abused word, and not to make destructive violence a medicine for mortal ills, we will keep the path of healing nature. Not revolutions, but evolutions are the silent process of the great mother, wherewith she awakens slumbering powers, brings germs to maturity, gives renewed youth to premature age, and new life to seeming death. Let us see what this remedy comprehends, and how it heals. If we suppose nature to have an aim on the earth, that aim can be no other than the development of her powers in all forms, kinds, and ways. These evolutions proceed slowly, often imperceptibly, and for the most part they appear periodically. After a night of sleep follows a morning of awakening. Under the shade of the former, nature had recollected her powers in order to meet the latter with spirit. In the ages of man, childhood continues long. Body and mind advance with a slow growth until, with collected energies, the flower of youth breaks forth and the fruit of later years comes gradually to maturity. Very improperly have these periods of development been called revolutions. There is nothing here that revolves, but faculties are evolved, developed, ever the more recondite and deeper line come forth to view, which without many a preceding one could not have been brought into action. Therefore nature made periods. She gave the creature time to recover itself from one exertion gone through with, in order to begin with joy and to accomplish another and more difficult. For when the plant puts forth a flower, or when the fruit is forming in it, unquestionably more inward and finer forces are put in action than when the sap was entering the stem and the lowest leaves were brought forth. In the ordinary course of things, nature does not leave her work until all its physical powers have been brought into action, the innermost, as it were, turned outward, and the development which at every step is assisted by a kindly epigenesis has become as perfect as it could become under the given conditions. Men are accustomed to regard each individual object and especially each living individual as an isolated whole. But a nearer view shows it to be connected with soil, climate, weather, and with the periodical breath of all nature, and that, according to these, it lasts for a longer or shorter time, grows early old, or easily renews its youth. Man, a rational, moral, and political creature, lives by means of these capacities and powers, in a peculiar and infinitely extended element. His reason is connected with the reason of others, 
his moral culture with the conduct of others his capacity to constitute himself a free being both in himself and in connection with others is so intimately connected with the way of thinking the reasonableness the active enterprise of many that out of this element he must needs be like a fish on dry land or a bird in a space destitute of air his best powers die out his capacity remains a dead capability and all effort out of time and place and without the cooperation of the elements is like a flower in the midst of winter it is nature that makes seasons it is she that furthers capacities she furthers them also in humankind individual men classes corporations whole societies and nations can only advance with this stream they have done all if they steer wisely upon it let no one think that if all the regents of the earth from the proudest negro king to the mightiest khan of the tartars should combine to make today yesterday and to hinder forever the progressive development of the human race whether it lead to youth or to old age they could ever accomplish their aim this can never be an aim with wise rulers simply because there is no sense in such fruitless endeavor a wise ruler then will always regard himself as the householder not as the antagonist of nature he will improve every circumstance which she offers to the best issues here leaves are falling there a whole autumn of leaves lie already in their shrouds he will not attempt to restore them again to their former places on limb and twig can he give them back their former freshness and sap which made them a living whole with the tree on which they hung and if he cannot do this how then will he crown himself with a withered wreath of dried leaves because they were other once than they are now what nature could not keep will the gardener keep it and that too not in conformity with the ends of nature but in direct opposition to them infinitely more beautiful the task to follow nature to mark her times to awaken powers whenever they slumber to promote thought activity invention joy and love in whatsoever field of useful employment necessity comes at last and compels with iron scepter he who obeys reason and measure will prevent necessity often he will need only to beckon with a lily staff of oberon and here new flowers will spring instead of the withered ones and there if the blossom time is past nourishing fruits will come to maturity he will come to the aid of the young shoot and take it under his protection against oppressive weeds the old wild tree he will not cut down but graft more genial fruits upon it and the rejuvenized tree will wonder itself at its nobler existence a slight anticipation of this kind by which one nation had got the start of another has often secured to it for centuries unattainable advantages england acquired the position which she now occupies by a somewhat earlier adoption and application of certain points of constitutional finance and commerce which had long before germinated in other countries but which folly and passion had suppressed after many violent revolutions which passed over her like bloody thunder showers it was given to the most peaceful and silent revolution to awaken her new activity and thereby to establish for centuries the prosperity of a living constitution if in the time of william the third she had attempted to renew the feudal military and forest laws of william the conqueror where would she be now all orders and arrangements of society are the children of time this ancient mother produced nourished educated them she adorned and fitted them out and after a longer or shorter term of life she buries them as she buries and renews herself whoever therefore confounds his own being with the duration of an order or institution 
gives himself unnecessary torment that which was before thee will be behind thee too if it is to be for thine own part act understandingly and wisely time will proceed in its great course and accomplish its own be in thine own person more than thine order and then however that may grow old thou wilt be for thyself and for others always young yea the darker the night the brighter shalt thou be a star he who does not raise himself above the breastwork of his order is no hero within it an order as such makes only puppets personality makes worth and merit the more that idle dead hull which conceals the best as well as the poorest kernel falls away the more the fair and ripe fruit appears assuredly therefore it is no retrocession but an evolution of the times when the order ceases to be all and men demand to see in each order persons men active beings and since without a new incursion of barbarism and with the daily increasing necessities of europe this feeling must necessarily increase there remains only one counsel which can secure each one against the senescence of his order be something in your order and then you will be the first to perceive to avoid and to amend its defects its old age will appear rejuvenized in you precisely because there is something in you which would grace every form and live in all the excellent paolo sarpi wrote a treatise the title of which attracted me exceedingly how opinions are born and die in us i was very curious to become acquainted with its contents and although i saw from foscanari's extract of grisellini that it was not likely to contain what i had supposed this capital problem nevertheless has often been in my thoughts many are the ways in which from earliest childhood we arrive at opinions with which we clothe ourselves body and soul many of them cleave to us with great tenacity and the silliest we generally keep concealed behind our innermost ninth skin where let no one presume to touch them unfortunately however time will touch them and often with very rude hands and he who in order to save his life that is his reason peace and the self-consciousness of internal worth cannot yield the skin and hair of his opinions to the meddling satan is in bad hands for that which is mere opinion or even false opinion will assuredly perish in the fierce fire of purification but is it not something better that shall arise in its place instead of opinions received on authority or even as franklin relates from politeness knowledge from conviction reason approved by our own investigation and a self-acquired felicity shall be our portion the old man in us must die that a new youth may spring up but how may this be can a man return into his mother's womb and be born again to this doubt of old nicodemus the only answer that can be given is palingenesis not revolution but a happy evolution of the faculties which slumber in us and by means of which we renew our youth what we call outliving ourselves that is a kind of death is with souls of the better sort but sleep which precedes a new waking a relaxation of the bow which prepares it for new use so rests the fallow field in order to produce the more plentiful hereafter so dies the tree in winter that it may put forth and blossom anew in the spring destiny never forsakes the good as long as he does not forsake himself and ignobly despair of himself the genius which seemed to have departed from him returns to him again at the right moment bringing new activity fortune and joy sometimes the genius comes in the shape of a friend sometimes in that of an unexpected change of times sacrifice to this genius even though you see him not 
hope in back-looking, returning fortune, even when you deem her far off. If the left side is sore, lay yourself on the right. If the storm has bent your sapling one way, bend it the other way, until it attains once more the perpendicular medium. You have wearied your memory? Then exercise your understanding. You have striven too diligently after seeming, and it has deceived you. Now seek being. That will not deceive. Unmerited fame has spoiled you. Thank heaven that you are rid of it, and seek in your own worth a fame which cannot be taken away. Nothing is nobler and more venerable than a man who in spite of fate perseveres in his duty and who, if he is not happy outwardly, at least deserves to be so, he will certainly become so at the right season. The serpent of time often casts her slough, and brings to the man in his cave, if not the fabled jewel on her head and the rose in her mouth, at least medicinal herbs which procure him oblivion of the past and restoration to new life. End of excerpt from Tython and Aurora by Johann Gottfried Herder, 1743-1803. to